but I, I think everything you do professionally is about human connection. So I don't believe when I was bringing in multi-millions of dollars of revenue at, at Viacom, I don't believe that I was a brilliant negotiator or a brilliant business person. I just knew how to connect with people and they wanted to work with me and or for me or with me. And that's the only thing I think I've ever been any good at. And I guess that's what comedians need to do, right? We've got to get onto a stage and connect. So if there's one thing I hope I know how to do when the wind's blowing in the right direction, it's exactly that. Welcome to the Humorology Podcast with me, Paul Barros, and my glittering lineup of guests from the worlds of business, sport, and entertainment who are here to share their wisdom and their use of humour with you. Humorology is the study of how humour can dramatically improve your business success and your life. Humorology puts the fun into business fundamentals, increases the value of your laughing stock, and puts a punchline back into your bottom line. Please remember to like, subscribe and leave a review wherever you get your podcasts. My guest on this edition of the Humorology podcast is a perfect fit for our show. She began her career as an entertainment executive for an independent TV company purchased by Carlton Television. She then moved on to play a leading role in some of the most influential companies in entertainment, including MTV, UK TV and Viacom, where she was responsible for getting seminal series like South Park and SpongeBob SquarePants on the air. However, being a brilliant business person is not all our guest has to offer. Her award-winning stand-up comedy has taken the country by storm. When she isn't leading companies to success or audiences to laughter, you can find her as a frequent guest on shows like BBC's QI, The Apprentice You're Fired, and on the radio as a guest on The Museum of Curiosity, The Unbelievable Truth and Saturday Live. Her pithily titled podcast, Namaste Motherfuckers, takes a laughter-filled look at the intersection between comedy, business and life. Callie Beaton... Welcome to the Humorology Podcast. Thank you. I think we should just leave it at the introduction because that was so lovely. I think anything I say is just going to take the sheen off. So um, it's been nice. Thanks for having me on. <laughs> Good night. <laughs> oh, no, it's lovely to have you on because we, we sort of uh, realised that we actually have so many people in common and, have, and, and with our TV careers and our um, sort of psychological NLP careers have sort of crossed with the comedy. And so we've, we've, we know a lot of the same people, but we've never properly met so it's lovely to meet you properly we might be the same person it might be like uh it might be like steve coogan interviewing alan partridge <laughs> uh, it might just be one of us who knows has anyone ever seen us in the same room paul oh, that's my question oh and it's a it's a good question and one that our <laughs> listeners can write in on a, with a postcard at any at any time um, I, I wanted to go back to uh the start where you were brought up in dorset but as uh with uh parents as teachers and was actually humour valued in your family growing up? Do you know I don't ever think of my you know some comedians say oh it was always like watching comedy on the telly and everyone having a laugh I mean we did watch some comedy on the telly but I wouldn't say my house was a it was a loving household but I wouldn't say there was a lot of laughter in it, um, my my family are quite intellectual and kind of quite bookish, and I w I wasn't quite so much like that. But I will say that, as you may or may not know, um, I I did go to an all boys school because that was the school my parents taught at, and we lived in the grounds of that school. It was a private school, and so I was educated there. And I will say this: that if you are the only girl in an all boys school at the age of eight, and you happen to be overweight with ginger hair, as I was, I'm, I've still got the ginger hair. Um, and I, yeah, you kind of do need to develop quite the personality <laughs> to combat a feeling of absolute not belonging. So I think I did develop a sense of humour or certainly a capacity to exude humour as a child, but I wouldn't say it was because of my family per se. Was that, that the outsider syndrome that we see so much coming from uh, comedians that, that, you know, we're obviously the only girl in a boys' school, that's it. Did you think that you already had that show off gene, for want of a better word, or, or was there some need for attention or adulation uh, that you realised you had to stand out even at that age? 
Well, it's one hell of a Venn diagram, isn't it? Whatever it is that makes comedians want to be comedians. And as much as we're all obviously different people, I would say that at least 90% of people on the circuit, there's a, a big old crossover on the Venn diagram of on the one hand, self-loathing, insecurity and a lack of thinking will ever be good enough. On the other hand, look at me, look at me, affirm me. So I think you sort of need those two, like a sort of self-doubting show off. I think that's probably what you need to do to be a comedian. So, um, yeah, and I did used to perform. I think I found it easier being other people than myself there. So I was in all the school plays, even though I was quite insecure off stage and I played musical instruments and I used to play the piano for hours a day just so I didn't really have to engage with with people because I found it so hard being the girl in that school. So I became a very accomplished um, pianist only because it was a strategy for avoiding conversation. So I think, I, yeah, I did always perform from young, but it was an it was an escape, I suppose, at the time, as much as the need to show off, but maybe a bit of both. Well, well now you actually uh, do a lot of keynote speaking and you do counselling and, and uh, the coaching as well. I mean, was that you think important to gaining the confidence and and the ability to co- communicate and connect with people yeah i mean i guess it goes from both sides doesn't it so on the one hand i could never have become a comedian when i was younger so i started um at the age of 45 which sounds late although now that i'm a few years on from that i realize it, it wasn't late but it took me till then to find my voice enough to be able to make people laugh on stage so I wouldn't have remotely been able to do it in my 20s or 30s so so my business co- career and my life to date really informed on my comedy and then the other way round I, I think that comedy now absolutely informs everything I do so I mean I'm a much much better keynote speaker than I would be if I didn't happen to also be a, a comedian so I do think that it all it all absolutely links and I guess the bit and I know you know I'm speaking to the maestro when I say this but I, I think everything you do professionally is about human connection. So I don't believe when I was bringing in multi-millions of dollars of revenue at, at Viacom, I don't believe that I was a brilliant negotiator or a brilliant business person. I just knew how to connect with people and they wanted to work with me and or for me or with me. And that's the only thing I think I've ever been any good at. And I guess that's what comedians need to do, right? We've got to get onto a stage and connect. So if there's one thing I hope I know how to do when the wind's blowing in the right direction, it's exactly that. Well, you're hiding your light slightly under a bushel with when the wind's blowing in the right direction, because uh, (laughs) honestly, to survive in the worlds you have uh, survived in, because you were on the board of directors with David Cameron at Carlton TV, and to survive in those worlds and, uh, and that rarefied air, if you like, you have to have been good at not just connection, but I would have presumed instant rapport. So was that something that already you had or did you develop that over time? I think I probably have always had a capacity for developing rapport in the short term. I think it took me, like many people, you know, you evolve as a human, don't you? And most of my really sustaining friendships have have been ones that started in my 30s or later. So I don't think I particularly knew how to maintain um, personal relationships as well as I do now when I was younger. But I certainly knew how to strike up rapport, probably in a slightly less authentic way when I was younger, probably lots of jazz hands and reading a room and knowing what people would like to hear from me in order to like me I'd like to think now I connect from a bit more of an authentic position and perhaps that's why relationships last last in a better longer way for me but I think it's funny because I never thought when I was I was in my early 30s when I was in that boardroom and at the time I didn't really think about being the youngest person there and the only woman there I, I remember someone saying it to me after about a year and me thinking oh yeah so I, I've become more aware of those things as I've got older. I think at the time I was just desperately fighting imposter syndrome and thinking if I don't, you know, if I, if I don't do the wrong thing and if I work really hard, I won't get found out. So, so yeah, I, I don't suppose I've ever been very confident in who I am or what I've been doing, but perhaps that just means I'm not a narcissist. Maybe that's a nice thing. Oh, well, it is a, nas- a nice thing. I was going to say it is a narcissist, but that's wrong. It is a narcissistic <laughs> thing. Yeah. I'm a nice narcissist. <laughs> a nice narcissist. Peter Piper. Uh, well, no, it's, uh, that imposter syndrome is always very interesting because it comes up. Uh, we had 
had Omid Jalili on the show, and and he said, comedians are people who oh, I love Omid. Who, well, you know, comedians are people who need laughter as strangers to validate us. We're all mentally ill. I mean, I, I you know, I, I, I do similar things to you but i get brought in to train people how to make their speeches and uh, and and connect with an audience but i would say that i don't know anybody who isn't a psychopath who doesn't have imposter syndrome no no if you don't have it you you are already you have no self awareness do you yeah, it's funny, I watch, um, it's quite rare, but you sometimes watch, com most comedians are very insecure and they'll come off stage, me included, if there's one thing that didn't go well, that's the thing we'll remember. So we'll come off stage going, oh, why did I mess up that joke? Or why did I forget that bit? Or why did I trample over my own applause break? I, quite occasionally, you will see people who have the other extreme. So you'll see acts who have an abysmal gig sort of stink out the room, which we all have, by the way, that's not a judgment on anyone who does that. It's inevitable you'll have those nights. Um, and, but then come off with massive swagger, not just I'm gonna style this out, but genuinely I think, think they had a good gig. And sometimes I'm massively envious of those people. I think, wow, I would be so much more relaxed if I was that person. And other times I just think I wouldn't get better. If I had a gig like that and thought that was a good gig, I would be ignoring the feedback from the room. And it is my belief, and I think most comedians believe that the, it's never the audience, it's always you. So you can't come off and go, oh, well, it was a Saturday night and they were really drunk or the lighting wasn't great or the tech guy messed up my microphone. At the end of the day, it's on you, really. And yeah, it can not help if things go wrong in the room. But honestly, it's for you to save, make or break the time you're on stage. So I do see people who I don't think have any imposter syndrome. And I sometimes am envious, but usually I think, well, our, le our learning comes from knowing when the feedback wasn't so great, right? And then yeah. we're like, how would you fail better if you didn't even know you failed? So I'm very aware when I fail, which is frequently and flamboyantly quite a lot of the time. <laughs> No, I, I I love what you're saying there because it, it chimes with things. We had uh, Dr. Richard Bandler, who was the co-developer of the field of NLP, and I know you've done some NLP over yeah. the years. And uh, that's a good booking. Yeah. I wouldn't have mind having Richard Bandler on my podcast. Oh, well, well no, yeah, well I know Richard and everything, but Richard always says, which chimes with what you just said, uh, is the meaning of your communication is the response you get. So you're saying, you know, if if I stunk out the room, it's my fault. And I, I'm always trying to explain that to people, that you have to take responsibility. You can't, I mean, we get a lot of business people living listening to the podcast. You go into a room and you go, um, I did a really good pitch, but they were really stupid and they didn't get it. Uh, you're never going to learn anything from that, are you? No, it's funny, isn't it? And you and I will, I mean, you know, as we joked about being the same person, but we'll have gone through very similar experiences. And usually, I mean, if something's going to go wrong, as in some really basic fundamentals aren't in a room set up, it's more likely to happen in a comedy club than it is in a corporate. But I've done, you know, I've, I hosted, um, well, I won't say who it was for, but I hosted one award show. I do lots of hosting of award shows. Um, and I did one where everything that could possibly have gone wrong went wrong, including the fact that the um, lapel mic didn't work, the headset mic didn't work, and then the radio and then the handheld um, battery ran out. And I ended up doing about an hour and a half on stage, on and off, you know, um, with no mic. And uh, at a certain point, you know, my agent said, oh, you should have just left. And I thought, well, first of all, anyone in the room if I leave is not going to have any sympathy for the fact that, that I was left in an impossible situation so everyone in the room will think that was a real prima donna and you ruined our night but also but then again staying you know we use our voices don't we for a living so I mean that was actually really bad for my voice let alone anything else and it is what I you know I always get quite uh, not upset but I worry if the mic doesn't work because I can't strain my voice because I'm on stage for a couple of hours every day probably um so, but even then I, I had to make the decision I have decided to stay I am in charge of these people's evening. They've all put their hat in the ring for an award. They're really excited to know if they're gonna get one. They don't care if the host has had all these problems. So I have to somehow be gracious and fun and nice to them because it's completely not their fault. And I do think if you have that attitude of humility, if I'm here to make you all feel good, you know, when I MC comedy clubs, if only seven people have turned up because it's Eurovision and the football and I want them to feel amazing that they turned up. I don't want to keep saying, oh, and of course, you know, there's no noise in the room because there's only seven of you. I want to say you're the best seven people in the world for coming here. So I think you're right. There's, there's, We have to take, 
you, you're never, um, I, can't, I think it might be Jay Brandt who said it, or maybe it was Sarah Millican, but you're never as good as your, um, as your best joke or as bad as your, and you're never as good as your best gig or as bad as your worst gig. And I think if you're willing to take the kind of highs, you've got to be able to take the lows. So somehow it's on you, isn't it? And you won't always be everyone's cup of tea. But I do think if people, and you, that's why you've got to be agile on stage, right? If, you, if, if all you've got is your one thing that you say in your one way, well, when the variables creep in, you're not working live, the audience can smell that a mile off and you've lost the room. So I, I always think, and, and if you say on stage, and you, you know this better than anyone, if, if something goes terribly wrong and you say something not disparaging of the people who've got you there, but if you say, well, of course, I had all this lovely thing planned, but now this has happened and a, and a bird just pooed on my head and, and, and I fell over. So it's a bit hard to do that. That's much better than going on and pretending none of that happened. So, yeah, I think it's kind of authenticity and it is, yeah, owning it. It's like it's up to you, isn't it? That's what we're paid for. Authenticity and attitude, isn't it? Because uh, you come to it with the right attitude I, I always think that the people who do best uh, have an attitude I always say that I have an attitude whereby whoever I'm meeting or where, whatever stage I'm on I'm assuming that everybody in the room is lovely because what's the alternative you know, and you sound like mm -hmm. you go in with that same attitude all the time how do you how do you visualize that if you like well, if I take, um, well, there's a couple of things, aren't there? So I used to have a real fear of public speaking, like a proper fear of it and conviction I couldn't do it. So when I first found myself in boardrooms, I was absolutely terrified of presenting in anything more than a sort of boardroom setting with a few people around a table. And obviously I did have to learn to do it, um, I, but I didn't feel as if I would be a natural at it. And... I think you you can play a couple of different movies in your head, can't you? And I've trained, like you, trained lots of people in public speaking. And if the movie you play in your head is messing up your words, the audience hating you, falling over on the way to the stage, wishing you'd never done it, then, then there's a bit of a chance that might happen. If you choose to play a bit of a different movie in your head before you go on, I think that helps. But it's also, um, and you learn this, don't you? The way in which whole groups of people listen as opposed to individuals is very different. So when you're looking at a sea of 3,000 faces and you think, well, they look blank. Well, yeah, that would be a blank look if you were having a coffee with that one person, but you're not. So they may well be listening, but not feeling the need to emote what they're feeling. And in comedy clubs, first of all, if people don't laugh, that is on me as the comedian or the host. So if they're not laughing, I, I will never do that. Oh, they liked that in Brighton. What's wrong with you, you know, Camberley? I'll just think, well, okay, I need to do something different. But with heckling, and I, I because I MC so much and I do the big clubs a lot and there's, there's often rowdy clubs, I don't normally think that the hecklers are nasty people. I think they might be drunk, they might have something to prove, they might... So I will absolutely take control of the situation and put a heckler down, but I very, very rarely would want to leave the heckler feeling anything other than they were a bit of a fun part of the show. It's very rare I would full-on say, why don't you shut the something up, you know, and, and leave or whatever. I mean, I, if that needed to happen, I'd let the security do it. But I, I would try. So I do. But I, it really upsets me when I see comedians or MCs punching down to audience members, because without the audience members, we actually don't have a job. Well, I, I think that's so true. And it's it's that idea. And, and this is something for our audience to take away is that idea that the attitude is what dictates the altitude of of how good you get at it. Because if you come at it with a with a sort of punching down attitude, and you really uh, I want to put them in their place, it doesn't necessarily do you any good. Because then the the rest of the audience looks at you and think uh, you're a bit of a git. Yeah, it makes me, and it also makes me very nervous if I see. I mean, if you're on a mixed bill as a comic and another comedian does that, that's that's up to them and, and if you're and you can do your thing as a comic but if there's an MC who does that and I'm not MCing I'm one of the acts my heart just sinks if the MC has gone in and laid into the audience because I think okay I'm now going to need to spend my first five minutes as well as trying to be funny trying to make this room feel okay again and and you do sort of need to give the audience a bit of um self-esteem you know sometimes you get a really quiet audience and if you really lay into them for being quiet 
then I think they just get more and more of, they just don't enjoy it and they feel really self-conscious where there are lots of ways to get a quiet audience to be rowdier. So yeah, I in generally don't think attacking attacking people who are effectively paying your wages, I generally don't think that's a great idea. <laughs> Call me uh, old-fashioned. Okay, let me write that down. <laughs> don't attack audience. <laughs> yeah. no, don't no. attack the hand that feeds uh, you. No, no but I, I, I actually think it's, uh, you used a word um, which was, I, I don't adaptability or flexibility earlier on which I think is uh, is really interesting and because you have got had such a, a varied background you you've learned a lot of skills that help with sort of more than one thing you can't just do heckle put downs and and, and shout at people you can coax you can cajole you can play but isn't that what great communication is all about is that that ability to to play with people on some level and uh, and you're just doing it as a keynote speaker and as a comic professionally yeah i think it is all about connection isn't it and it's all i mean my my son as you may know is is autistic and and raise he's 25 now so he's not a little kid anymore but raising an autistic kid and having to really deconstruct what communication means in order to help him understand it a bit better you know you'll know that autistic you know neurodiverse people are typically and of course there are they say if you've met one autistic person you've met one autistic person because it's such a nuanced spectrum so I don't wish to generalize about anybody listening he'll be like well that's not the case for me but it is fair to say that many neurodiverse people um, aren't as able to listen as to as to talk you know not as able to receive information as to transmit it so I think I learned a lot about um the kind of I, I actually did my master's in nlp quite a while before my son got his diagnosis so it wasn't connected but it all helped um knowing a bit of nlp and 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 watching well learning so much from my son really which i have done you know i've learned an enormous amount from from him and from raising him and living with him all those years but i do above all i think what makes excellent communication and makes people excellent at what they do when it comes to connecting is being able to turn up and by turn up I don't mean physically turn up but mentally turn up and work live in the situation because if you listen to learn rather than listen to respond if you're actually actively thinking well I you know if you if you now had a list of questions and weren't listening to the response your listeners would immediately know that as opposed to if you're genuinely jumping off something I say to the next thing and it's the same with any it doesn't matter if you're giving a speech and the audience aren't actually speaking back to you they're giving you loads of information and the first thing I always I'm sure you say this too to people and do it yourself the first thing I always say when I'm teaching people to be a speaker you know is when you first get on the stage and you take the microphone out of the stand or maybe you're already mic'd up just take a couple of beats partly because it gives you some gravitas you've just stood there and owned the room but but actually look at the room from the stage stand there and take a couple of breaths and be like right here I am here they are now I'm going to see what they need. And it's amazing how many people don't do that. They just go racing on. It's like, well, this is what I was going to do. So, um, yeah, it's, but it's, a, you know, God, I'm not perfect at it, Paul. I, I you know, fall on my face as often as anyone, well, for sure. You're very, very good at it. So, and, and none of us are perfect at it. But I, I'm interested in that because I would call that the ultimate listening experience. I would call that, in psychological terms, listening off the top, where actually you're looking at people and properly engaging. I, I was down uh, at MIP in Cannes, where we were doing, and a friend of mine said to me, the night before I was doing the opening address, he said, he said drunkenly at two o'clock in the morning at the C21 bar, which you probably know, um, he, he was like, what's your opening line tomorrow? And I went, I don't know. And he went, bollocks. Every good speaker knows what their opening line is. I said, no, really good speakers actually read the room and will have, you know, a, yeah. a vague idea of, of, you know, things that you say. But if you are so married to your script, you're going to miss all the good stuff. You're going to, you know, the, the person who falls off their chair, you know, or, or something. And your job, and which I think you've just described beautifully, is actually to connect with them and look around and see what's happening. And, and then, uh, you know, go into your routine rather than I've got my opening gag. I've got my opening gag. Yeah, it's definitely, and you also, the bit people, it's a real quick win as well. Um, listen to me going all David Brent on you. But if you if you do do something that is genuinely live in the room that you could not have prepared, 
you get so many brownie points. You so have the audience on your side because they love to think that you're kind of fitting the wheels while you fly the plane. That's a lovely thing to feel. You know, we all want to watch somebody and be like, oh, this is actually real. They're not just kind of effectively reading off a mental auto cue. So it's it's twofold, isn't it? One, it makes you, and actually when you're waiting to go on, I, I'm, I'm not massively thinking, what will I say like you? I sort of know where, where I'm going to go directionally, you know, to a degree, of course but I will be just letting whatever's happening happen. And sometimes the thing I'll say is a silly thing that happened backstage, but again, people love that. They wanna know if something weird happened backstage, you know, if, if tucking the mic into my bra, you know, ripped my dress or whatever, they think that's funny. That's a funny thing to hear. They want to know what happened before I came out looking glossy on stage. So whatever it is, I, I just think, whatever working live in the room means, I think it's great to do it. But I used to skydive and, and um, you'd get sense, literally get sensory overload when you first jumped out of the plane. And the number of seconds of sensory overload get less the more you skydive because you become accustomed to it and it's a bit like that with public speaking isn't it it's like you're 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 in such a state of overload when you're not used to it that the thought of managing to do any of that would just be a bridge too far but like any muscle if you keep doing it then you get the capacity to relax enough to be as good as you can be and get out of your own way don't you it's like right okay now I'm going to breathe and do this as I'd like to do it well, yeah, and I think that magic, by the way, I love the uh, uh, fitting the wheels while flying the plane thing. I've never heard that before. I just, I, I just <laughs> A love story that. of my life, of course. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I just love the fact that you, you're getting out of your own way because I always think that it's, uh, the, you know, a lot of people write into us and say, you know, we love the tips that you get from people who are really good at this. But I really love the idea that you are essentially giving yourself enough time to connect in the normal way that you and I would connect over a, a, a beer in a pub or, or a cup of coffee with a friend. Because I don't think that when it's done well, and you know, you do it brilliantly as a keynote and as a comedian, it just looks like you are chatting to somebody over a coffee. Isn't that where the magic happens when it's all just at that level? Yeah, I always think um, with everything I've ever done in my life, and I'm by no means unique in this, I'll always end up doing so much more kind of prep than I need and stressing, not, not, not that everyone's a big sort of prepper, but it takes so much effort to make things look effortless, doesn't it? You know, I'm doing a speech, I did a speech uh, this morning, I'm doing one on Friday, and I really will put in a lot, a lot of effort into writing those speeches, thinking about them, doing the briefing calls, listening to what's required, but by the time I'm going to the event on the day, by the time I'm in my frock, in the car, going to the event, I will be quite relaxed because I've done the groundwork. And I literally, I mean, but it's a bit like trying to revise in the queue into an exam. You know, it's too late then. Just forget about it and see and just turn up and do your best. So by the time, I, it's a bit like when you've packed for a holiday and you can't really stress about anything once you're getting on the plane because you're on the plane now. So I, I, all the pain for me is in the lead up and the actual turning up on the day and doing it is lovely, but it's only lovely because of the graft that went in beforehand. Well, it's the duck, isn't it? It's like underneath it's all going. But I, I agree, actually. I'm always much more relaxed when I'm, I'm going to do a keynote because I think I, I know it. I've done it. There's no point in, you know, stressing about it. This is the fun bit. Actually, the research and everything, I agree, is is the stressy bit. It is, yeah. And, and also just the... um. It gets a bit more formulaic, doesn't it? And again, I'll be very careful because there may well be people who, who have booked me or will book me listening to this. And but so, so it's not that, you know, a lot of comedians don't like doing corporates. And I do like doing corporates because it's the world I'm from. But also the corporates I do are a bit different. I do tend to do keynotes and after dinner and, and awards. And those, the bit that can be monotonous is, okay, another briefing call, another like, oh, they want you to talk about, you know, adaptability and leadership. And you're like, oh, you know, here we go. But then every time I do the briefing calls, once I'm on them, of course, it's a new set of people who are interesting. So then you're connecting with people in the business who invariably have got interesting stories to tell because human beings tend to. And then you're up and running and you're like, oh, this isn't just an abstract speech about you know, change uh, for a bank. This is actually, I don't literally mean uh, coins, uh, yeah. but as in <laughs> adaptation, <laughs> but it's lit, but it's, yeah. So, so I think you can, you can choose how to, and actually I, I don't know about you. I always stay for the, um, I always do the lunches or the dinners before the 
after dinner or after lunch speech, partly because I like a free meal. <laughs> but that's when you get to read the room. So yeah. I always think, you know, when they say, oh, would you like to have your meal, you know, in this side room? And I always say, no, I'll have it in with you because then you're looking, you're hearing things, you're reading them. And by the time you go on, you've been given a massive head start as opposed to sitting in a cupboard somewhere with your chicken nuggets because you can do that at home. Can't well, you? I, but that's really <laughs> interesting as well because so many people want to set themselves aside from uh, the audience. Um, I was just doing uh, something for MIP in Cannes, which I, I do twice a year. And they're always surprised that I actually stand at the front when people are coming in and chat to them on the way in. And they're, they're thinking that's harder. I'm thinking that's so much easier because you come in, you know a few people, then why, by the time something starts, you're going, I was just uh, talking to some people from South Africa and they just told me this. And we're already, you've, you've broken down the barriers by doing those kind of things. So, so I, I mean, I think if I was to give people a tip about it, what you said about being around them more helps with the whole performance rather than hinders it. Definitely. And it's also, if you, you know, there are false economies all over the place, aren't there, in our working and personal lives. And I think it's a real false economy to think, oh, I don't want to, I could, you know, this thing I'm doing on Friday, it means I'm gone for like five hours instead of two hours to do the event because I'm going to go to the lunch. But it's a, it is a false economy not to. And, and a sort of similar thing, but from the other sort of side of, of life, from the comedic side, um, there's a brilliant show, which you will know uh, because you know the industry so well, called The Blame Game, which is on BBC Northern Ireland, which is the Northern Ireland's kind of equivalent of Have I Got News For You. But actually, that doesn't quite do it justice. It's a phenomenal show that um, runs with the same panellists. All, all of them are the same. They have one guest panellist. Um, and it runs week in, week out. And if you want to see how to be a brilliant panellist on a show like the regulars are outstanding. And I was lucky enough to be asked along as the guest panellist and they do not They do try to have people who aren't, who aren't from Northern Ireland. And obviously, if you're on a political topical show in Northern Ireland, that is, there are many pitfalls you could fall into as the outsider and you're not necessarily going to be the sort of welcome voice. So when I did that show, first of all, I researched it pretty much more than I've researched any other show I've ever done because I knew that I couldn't instinctively rely on my knowledge. But the other thing that I thought was brilliant that they said, Tim McGarry, who hosts it, who's one of you know, Ireland's brilliant. most loved and brilliant comedians. Yeah, he's brilliant. And as we were waiting to go on, um, and by then I'd spent a couple of hours with them and with the researchers, he said, oh, by the way, Callie, it's done in front of a you know, live audience. This was all pre-COVID I did it. He said, by the way, Kelly, we do let the um, the guest person, if they want to, they can do this, the warm up for five minutes because it sometimes just means the room have already bought into you before you go on stage. And he literally said it as we were going on. And I said, yeah, I'll do that. So I went on and I did it. And sure enough, definitely helped. So I was able to muck about a bit, do my stuff. And by the time I was on, I was getting laughs for what I said. But it was only afterwards he said, I was only mucking about, Kelly. No one's ever, I always say that to people, no one, everyone's always told me to piss off. <laughs> he said, you're the only person who actually just went and did it. But do you know what? It was a really good idea because it meant I, they, I was like a bit like their friend by the time I was on the panel because I'd spoken to them and kind of basically emceed them. So I think what everyone can do is is almost the equivalent of that. But it takes a lot of, it's, um, it takes a lot of humility, doesn't it, for you to know that by spending your time listening to people, that's going to make you better on stage. That's the opposite of a sort of narcissistic, arrogant attitude. That's you saying, I want to give the room what they need. So I'm going to be in the room and find out what that is, which is a really lovely attitude to have as a speaker. I, I, I think, I, I, mean, I, I mean, I'd love to think that I'm doing it out of altruistic reasons and everything. I'm genuinely, I, a, well, A, I'm interested in people. I like people. But B, I think it just makes everything much easier once you're on stage I think yeah I think you're absolutely right it's giving it's like the homework being done for you isn't it and you can only do you know this you know that the thing that makes for a a, a a good speaker or an outstanding speaker is beyond the prep and what you've written and do you have you got good credentials and do you know how to do the technical stuff is what are you going to do when inevitably everything goes wrong and nothing that you thought was going to be there is going to go there I always say to people when I when, and I do much less of it now but when I was training people to do public speaking I used to say, if, if everything goes wrong, you know, if the, if the slides don't work and, and people aren't very nice to you and there's more or less people than you thought and the lighting's bad, it, 
if you can't do your speech, then you're not, and under those circumstances, you're not well prepared enough. So you've got to rely, you know, if you're ever like, I've got to have this slide. I do understand if you're like a Paralympian and your your crescendo is showing your five minute, you know, victory thing. It's a bit tough if that can't be shown. But generally, people, some, you see it, don't you? People get off stage by their own, like, with their own machinery of their own show. And it's like, hold on a minute, isn't it your show? Yeah. <laughs> what about you? Where are you on the stage? No, I, 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 I completely agree. And I, I, you said the difference between a good speaker and a great speaker but I would actually go even further into that and go I think the difference between a good speaker and a great speaker is one thing and that's humour because uh, you can be an inspirational speaker and go you know I won the Olympics I climbed the mountain I did it but without that element of humour and maybe self-deprecation as well I think that's the step change in, in, in what makes a difference. Callie, I really love your podcast, uh, Namaste Motherfuckers. Um, but it's kind of the podcast with, where comedy and self-help and business collide. But you have a background in coaching and counselling. And obviously I work in the same areas. And I wondered how much humour do you use in that side of your work? Yeah, it's funny. That's kind of why I did that that's kind of why I did the podcast was because I know the thing I do on stage. So I know what makes me, I hope a good keynote speaker and after dinner speaker is that it is authentic and it is emotionally intelligent. And if I've done my job, people will have laughed, they'll have virtually cried, they'll have goosebumps and they'll have some things they can take away that they can actually do something with. So that's what I try to do as a keynote speaker. And I sort of thought there's got to be a way to have a voice that does all of those things and they're not mutually exclusive. And I think the podcast has really helped me work out how to do that because my guests, you know, they are probably uh, probably about 60% of them are comedians, um, not least because I've got quite a good little black book of comedians. But I have loads of, you know, celebrities and writers and goodness knows who on it. And um, you'll have to come on it, Paul. And I do, I do find it... The, the, to have you can be you can have humor and disaster and tragedy cheek by jowl they say don't they with comedy um you know tragedy plus time equals comedy um but sometimes i don't think it always even needs to take time i think you can it can be really helpful it's like people having a real laugh awake isn't it yeah. it's not because they don't care about and love and feel the loss but it's about needing to do those things so it's it's been really interesting on the podcast that i mean my last questions on it, i have three questions that recur the first of the three is what 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 would you pick as your life changing namaste motherfucking moment so getting people's damasin moments which are often really moving, emotional. I've often cried at that point. People have, and my next joke, my next question is, what's your favourite joke? But it's kind of deliberate because you can have somebody's enormously meaningful moment and then a joke and then something else. So yeah, I, I definitely, it's a bit like what we've just said. You're working live in the room. So I would always be appropriate to what a coaching client, and I still do bits of executive coaching, I'll always read the room and I really hope I don't ever overstep the mark um, on it. But yeah, I think there's totally a place for humour. in, And also often you'll be led by your client. I mean, clients will often also say something really funny or maybe, they, maybe they've maybe they had a really serious stay at work and they want to be able to let off steam a little bit. So we're still having a professional meeting. But I don't think there is an occasion when... I literally don't think there's an occasion when you can't use humour, including in a eulogy or in a... I don't can't think of one where you cannot... I mean, perhaps if you're literally... No, even if I was at someone's deathbed, I am I would not rule out the fact that I might use humour. Well, I, I think the reason for that is, from a psychological perspective, is, is that actually it's a state change, isn't it? And it's one of the easiest state changes to do. I mean, you could choose to make people angry to get their state change, but it's a pleasant state change, which gives a perspective, which I would have thought when you're uh, coaching or counselling, is a way for people to step back and have a perspective about the situation, which I always think helps in the, in any kind of coaching. It's like, you need to see it from another angle, which is what humour does, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And I think it, it makes you as well, if you're laughing at something, you, exactly what you said, you've removed yourself from being massively entrenched in it. So it instantly gives you a more sort of curious, playful, objective view of a situation, which inevitably can help. The only thing I would, though, say as a sort of word of caution, and this will have come up a lot on your podcast, I'm sure, is when you use when you use 
humour as a way of masking things that actually matter. So if you can't say something real about yourself without self-deprecating or having a bit of a gag about it. So I know, I, you know, I've had most of my life on and off. I've had therapy. I, I'm a big believer in it. And I, I've had a couple of therapists say to me, well, why, why are you having to make a joke of that? Why, why, why is that? Why do you need to, why do you need to be funny in therapy? Um, and it's a really good question. Like of all places, that's probably a place. And I could do, st- that probably is the place I make the least jokes. Even then I can't resist the odd one. But I think I have learned in therapy that it perhaps isn't always helpful <laughs> to be like, why is cracking and going, why is my therapist not laughing? <laughs> oh, well, that's an interesting concept because as part of my training, I had to do six months of Jungian therapy. And I had, um, and she was excellent and very good, a, a classic a German woman who really, and I, I started to, after a month, go, can I make her laugh? So, Kelly, what makes you laugh? Uh, well, I've just got a puppy uh, and he makes me laugh. Uh, so, uh, and actually, in seriousness, I did get the puppy uh, partly because I obviously like hard work, as I'm now discovering, but because I realised I don't play enough in life and I'm a real workaholic. I mean, everyone who knows me will go, no shit. Uh, so I actually did realise the thing that's very much missing from my life now my kids have left home is sort of fun and play and letting your hair down. So he actually does really make me laugh. And when I'm playing with him, I literally, I feel like I'm about eight years old and I just completely forget about everything. It's totally in the moment. Um, I, I watch less comedy now than I did... As in for play, I, I watch comedy because I'm at comedy night, so I see a lot of comedy because I'm there working, and I love seeing my my kind of peers working. But I probably wouldn't sit at home and go, "Oh, I'll put on live at the Apollo. That'll be relaxing." Um, pod, I love um, podcasts. There are podcasts that make me laugh. Um, I love Parenting Hell. I love that podcast with Josh Widdicombe and um, and Rob Beckett. And um, my friend, I've got some friends. And in fact, both my children as well make me laugh a lot. And I've got a couple of friends. One of my friends, Joe is by far the funniest person I've ever met in the world. And I've met some of the funniest people in the world. And she is incredibly funny. So yeah, going out with Jo uh, for any reason uh, or just going around to her house makes me laugh. Well, isn't it uh, funny that actually when you're involved in comedy, the the last thing you want to do is go and see comedy for uh, for relaxation. <laughs> it's, uh, I, I found that. I find yeah, I'll it... watch friends' shows. Like, if, if, a mate's, <laughs> if a mate's got a show on, who I, I'll definitely go and see their show because I want to see their show. But, yeah, I wouldn't just be like, oh, I know, I'll go to Angel Comedy, it, which, by the way, is a brilliant club. I play it a lot. You should go. But I would not go, oh, I've got a night off. I'll go to Angel Comedy and watch a show. I just wouldn't. Oh, no, I, I understand it. I find it very difficult to be, you know, having spent 10 years at the comedy store, I find it very difficult to be in the audience now. And I will still go and see for it, mates nights, but I, 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 you're, aren't you always unpacking it as well? And just going, you know, it's like a room full of oh, comedians yeah, going, oh, <laughs> funny. Yeah, that, that nice setup. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah exactly yeah or, or thinking or cringing when it doesn't go well like doubly cringy more than the audience because you're like oh no that that was such a you could have easily saved that so I mean I do switch off when I'm MC it's a sign of a definitely really good act when, because I MC a bit more than I'm an act probably about two thirds one third in favour of MCing so obviously I am there for the whole night and it's always a sign of the acts that are outstanding that if if I forget I'm emceeing basically because I'm loving them so much there have been acts where I am so wrapped up in their acts that they they finish I'm like oh god I'm part of the show because they've got me so in the palm of their hand so that does happen occasionally that I totally forget I'm working because I just am in awe I mean Omid came and did a surprise set at something I was emceeing the other night and I just completely got wrapped up in what he was doing and, and virtually didn't get back onto the stage at all cause so relaxed was I watching him You've got this extraordinary um, business background where you reached sort of uh, great heights in the uh, the media business. If I asked you to write a business case for humour, what would you include in it? Well, I think um, one of the things that's very topical at the moment in companies, if we look at what sort of younger workforces want, it's all about balance and well-being and having their voices heard and telling their stories and about being able to stand out, isn't it? Not not having to sort of fit a mould. So you've got to create psychological safety, haven't you, if for that to be the case. And I think um, humour is a really important way to allow people to be vulnerable. And you as a, I don't mean you necessarily specifically, but leaders in businesses will 
definitely engender more trust and safety in their employees if they can also show chinks in the armor and a quick way to get into vulnerability without bearing your whole soul is humor i think so um so i, I think it's also um you know you know this going to can my business career was founded on relationships with people who didn't all have the same first language as me and humor is a massive icebreaker if you haven't got um all the words aren't quite as clear as they might be then you've got tone so humor is really important for that um and i think it tells you a lot about um about a person doesn't it? and if someone makes you laugh that is instant rapport if you if you sit next to someone at a dinner who you don't know and within the first two minutes, either they've made you laugh or you've made them laugh. You're up and running. I mean, you can't help but be in rapport and you can't help but think, oh, I'm glad I'm sitting here. So I, I, I would struggle more to think where it wouldn't feature in the manual than where it would. Is there a return on investment for companies to do it? I mean, because, I mean, you obviously do a lot of keynotes with companies who want to talk about um, adaptability and resilience and, and all those things. It, is it the bottom line that they are more adaptable, they are more creative, they are more resilient if they have a lightness of touch. I think you need to have a lightness of touch, don't you? I mean, otherwise, if you take everything so seriously, at the end of the day, I mean, I was going to say we're not saving lives. Some people are saving lives, but not doing what I do, not doing what you do. And and so somehow you've got to get objective enough to sort of think, I know this feels like it's life and death, and I know this feels horrendous or or out of my control or what's happening with this merger that's going on but if you can't in any way find a way to have anything of a laugh about it and I'm not saying you should have a laugh if you've been made redundant and you're losing your house and you haven't got the money to feed your kids I appreciate that's not not a funny situation but in the I think often the the, the funny bits are in the minutiae aren't they and that's what comedians do isn't it we mine the minutiae for, for funny things that are relatable and then the audience goes oh yeah that is really funny that thing and often they're dark difficult things so there are going to be some people out there who um, don't know how to use humour, Don't it doesn't come naturally to them. Do you think, because you came to it for as a professional later, do you think that everyone is potentially funny or is it the gift given to the few? It's really funny you say that because I just did some, um, I, I, I sometimes still do a bit of training in public speaking and I, I was... Um, training some ex-pro, ex-premier league, you know, pro footballers. Actually, a couple of them still do play. And um, and I we, we did it at the Frog and Bucket in Manchester, which is one of the most iconic kind of comedy venues in the country. And it wasn't training them to be comedians, but it was trying to unlock... They were all competent speakers, but perhaps a little bit dry and serious and needed to sort of work on the how, not the what. And um, not all of them were naturally uh, natural comedians or naturally funny, but... you anyone can learn to land one or two gags and they might need someone to write them for them they might need someone to help teach them how to deliver them or you can quote you know I sometimes quote you know and I give him the quote but when I talk I sometimes reveal in my speeches my late transition to stand up I sometimes get billed as a business speaker and then I I, I kind of reveal that um, towards the end and when I say you know and I met Joan Rivers and she said I should take up stand up and two weeks later I did my first gig and and then I say, you know, and to quote the late, great stand-up Bob Monkhouse, everybody laughed when I said I wanted to be a comedian. Well, they're not laughing now. Now, that always gets a laugh. I'm not pretending I came up with that. And anybody, so if you're, I always say to people, if you're a public speaker and you, you can't write jokes, well, you can absolutely quote someone's joke and that's funny and you're not you're not plagiarising. Um, or you could show a funny meme that made you laugh if you've got audio, audiovisual stuff, you know. So find a thing that is funny, even if it's not you and your voice on the stage. So why do people, you think, especially in business, fail to be funny? Because it's really hard. I mean, it's really hard to get a full laugh in a room. I, 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 it's taken me years to work out how to make a room, a whole room laugh, and I don't always succeed. And that's what I do for a living, you know, in all my aspects of my life. It's about even the corporate keynotes, you know, it is about generating laughter. And I'm sure you've had it, you know, I've had it, everyone will have done, where you... You think you've got a really funny thing to say and there's, you know, you're in a meeting at work and you say a thing you think is really funny and you just get blank faces looking at you. It, you're very exposed when you're trying to make people laugh and the failure is palpable. <laughs> you know, you've said a joke, everyone knows you thought it was funny and no one's laughing. So a fear of failure is a... Re but but you, you, you do not learn as much from a good gig as you do from a bad gig. And if you don't put yourself out there, you're not going to be able to make people laugh. But people don't do it partly because it may not be natural to them and partly because it's so excruciating when it doesn't work. 
Well, it's, it's the most bizarre thing anyway, because what you're trying to do is you're, you're trying to get people to do an involuntary action <laughs> in a, a crowded room, aren't you? And it, it's like, if and if it doesn't work, it's not like acting where they just love, clap politely at the end. If they don't laugh, it's the absence of a laugh that actually leaves you hanging, whether that's with one person or... The or... loudest silence you'll ever hear. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> yeah. It's also, um, it is, it's, it's a, yes, the silence can be deafening. Um, it's absolutely, and, and it is, it's that, it's that um, being willing to go out and actually, what you're saying to people is, I am going to hijack your amygdala. I'm going to hijack a part of you that's primal and you are going to roar with laughter even if you don't know that you want to. And that is some hell of a claim. And of course it doesn't always work. You know, how could it always work? And certainly when we were doing gigs to um, to socially distanced audiences, that made me realise, as a particularly as an MC, how hard it was to get an audience to hunt as a pack and how much you rely on everybody being thrown in together. Um, that's why I don't like, and the after dinner speeches, you know, when they're all cabaret style, which they always are, that is a hell of a lot harder than doing it theatre style. Yeah. You know, I'd much sooner have a theatre style auditorium, but obviously after dinner and awards are cabaret style, you've got to work with it, but they don't hunt as a room as easily. And that's your job is to make them cohesive. It's much harder when they're not all sitting together and looking the same direction. Oh, absolutely. And, and actually that's a good tip for people is actually if you get to set up the room, you know, do it theatre style. Have the, because I, 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 I heard you say, um, on your podcast, I think, uh, on th that actually sometimes you go and move the chairs yourself, which is exactly what I do. So I go, I want it to be set up in a way whereby the laughs will come easier. Absolutely. And there are some real basic tips on that. Also, to you know, this is what comedians do, particularly in Edinburgh, where people are fighting for audiences and you'll have some low turnouts unless you're a massive name, is literally like tape off the back. If you don't think the room's going to be full, make damn sure everyone sits at the front of the room. So if you've not got someone seating people, tape it off and then you can always, you know, um, untape it, but sort of reserve the bits you don't want people in. And yeah, the more you've got people huddled in together, the more they're going to respond to you with emotion, with laughter, with takeouts. You know, you, you need them all looking at you don't you and yeah. responding so uh, are you and are we are we addicted are we drug addicts are we uh, uh, i mean because i don't think there's any better feeling than that dopamine hit as a laugh comes back at you so you know is that the, the acceptance the the thrill is that impossible to replace with anything else i mean that's definitely my only addiction these days I, I I've, I've always been a sort of thrill seeker and an adrenaline junkie so for me and, I, and I've kind of put in a good account of myself in all the ways you would expect someone who's wired like me to have done so nowadays um, I get my highs from being on stage and running those are my two kind of ways to get that that chemical hit and yeah you know when life's hard the best 20 minutes or hour of the day is the bit on stage and it's the other it's the other 23 hours you want to worry about <laughs> <laughs> Callie we've reached a part of the show which we like to call quick fire questions quick fire questions who's the funniest business person that you've met I've worked with so many different production companies where they've been really funny MDs of production companies, but I can't think of a, a, a specific name. There was a guy, I've had him on the podcast, a guy that used to run Comedy Central in the US, a guy called Dave Bernath, who is one of the driest, like when you meet him, you were like, I can't believe you're running a comedy channel because he's so dry, but he is, I love dry humour. He would make me roar with laughter when I worked with him. So I, I would he's an unlikely comic voice but he always used to make me really laugh and he loves British humour he was the person who brought The Office to the US Dave Bernath will look him up what book makes you laugh? There's lots of um, I'll tell you a book that made me laugh recently was Louisa Young You Left Early which is actually about her lifelong relationship with um, Robert Lockhart the composer who basically killed himself with kind of alcoholism it's that's not a spoiler alert that that's out there in the public domain now you might think how could that book be funny but the bits in that she she's not a comedian she's a writer and a journalist but the funny bits in that book which are often reported dialogue between her and Robert so really things that are so so funny so I read that recently and that made me absolutely howl with laughter what film makes you laugh 
film as opposed to TV show? Well, you can go for any. We're not we're not that strict on the Humorology podcast. Well, I would say film. It's Bridesmaids. I love Bridesmaids. I think it's superb. I watched I've watched it quite often. Me and my daughter watch it together, probably about every two years. So Bridesmaids, I think, is beautifully uh, just beautifully done. And TV, I am just rewatching for the zillionth time Seinfeld from start to finish. And every time I watch that show, it's better than the last time. Funnily enough, I I just loved. I went to see Seinfeld. Did you see when he? did the Hammersmith Apollo um, a, a couple of years ago. Yes. And, and it was just yes, a masterclass, amazing. wasn't it? It was just, it, there wasn't one yeah, word it, out of place. And, and the length he can do. Yeah. No, he's, he is like, yeah, he is, the, he's the guy. He's the daddy. Let's take a shift to the other side and, and go completely the other way. What's not funny? I think what's not funny is anyone trying too hard to be funny so if someone's like desperately trying to be funny and that sounds weird for someone who's a comedian but it, it, the one thing that will alienate an audience is if someone's really really trying hard so you kind of need to almost like dial it down and and stop trying to be liked so much so I think anybody where there's an air of desperation and it doesn't feel sort of natural but generally I think it's people sort of just not reading the room really probably so do you have any limits on what can be used as comedy or is it the classic which we were talking about earlier tragedy versus time um, and anything can be funny or is it the other thing you mentioned earlier on the the punching down idea yeah it's it's all about that if you're not so I make jokes about my son's autism but are never at his expense it's completely celebratory my son's an autistic zookeeper how amazing how could I punch down even if I wanted to but it's all punching down to me as his idiotic mother who's sort of tried to get him through the world um there's I so I I would know I I've got a joke uh, not a joke but a whole bit that works really well at the moment which is about a, a, an ex-boyfriend of mine who was dying of throat cancer and again you've got to be really think how am I going to say this because there'll be people in the audience who've got throat cancer lost someone to cancer you know whatever it is but there's no if you handle it in a way that is not uh, where you're not lacking in empathy where you are never punching down to the thing and where you've got an end point. So what's your relationship to the topic? I'm not just talking about throat cancer and blokes with throat cancer randomly because I think it's a funny thing to talk about. I've got a, I've got skin in the game of that and I, and I explain what that is. So I think a, a decent comedian can do material about pretty much anything. It is comedy, but you just need to think about what's my viewpoint and why am I allowed to talk about this? Um, but yeah, I, there's nothing... There's literally nothing I would avoid. Oh, well, I mean, there are some awful things I would avoid talking about. I would not ever talk about paedophilia or, you know, anything like that, obviously. But beyond the absolute, why would you want to talk about something abhorrent? I know some comedians do. No, there's no no-go, I would say, for me. What word makes you laugh? Muff. <laughs> yeah. I'll leave that hanging. <laughs> Callie Beaton left her muff <laughs> hanging. Um, <laughs> you see in now, case you wanted an out point <laughs> you see suddenly uh, we're just in that place um, <laughs> would you rather be considered clever or funny definitely funny I'm, I'm more little hark at me with my big ego I'm more confident that I might be able to come across as clever your listeners to this episode might be like really <laughs> give us a clue uh, but I think I still feel very so I sort of know I know I'm not stupid I don't believe anyone's stupid actually um, but I know I know I'm not you know I've got an all right IQ but yeah I'm much less secure about my comedy so I much prefer people thought I was funny and finally Callie desert island gags you can only take one joke with you to a desert island. What would it be? I was told this by, do you know Peter Walsingham who runs downstairs at the King's Head? Um, yes. it's, the, it's the longest running comedy club in the UK. So their tryout nights on Thursday night has been going. It's the longest running comedy night in the UK. So it gives me a chance to plug the club, which I don't have stakes in, but I love Peter and I love the club. Peter is absolutely known for telling, and he will not mind me saying this, for telling bloody awful jokes backstage that go on for bloody ever when you're about to go on stage. So he's known for his kind of dad jokes. But he told me, so when he heard, now I've got a puppy, because my son is a zookeeper, he has lots of friends who are zookeepers, many of whom work at London Zoo. I live near London Zoo. So London Zoo's lion keeper is my cat and dog sitter, just to get your head around that. So I have a lion keeper who comes and looks after my cat and dog. 
very overqualified. So I'm only telling you this because I told Peter this and he said, remind me to tell you a joke, Callie, about lion, lion tamers. So here's the joke. He told me this on, th on Saturday. Um, there's a trainee apprentice lion tamer and, um, and they're in the ring and, and the, the experienced lion tamer's like giving them advice and they're like, right, it's your go now. So here's the, um, here's the kind of stick that you've got and, uh, and, and you're going to be able to get the lion onto the pedestal with the stick. And the apprentice says, well, if I can't get the lion on the pedestal with the stick, then the lion keeper says, well, um, the lion tamer says, well, there's a chair. So what you can do is you can use the, the chair and the stick and, and just coax the lion towards the pedestal. And, uh, and then the lion will probably go on the pedestal. And then the apprentice says, well, but what if I've, the stick and the chair don't work? What, what do I do then? And, and the lion tamer says, well, just pick up some shit from behind you and, and throw it at the lion. And the apprentice says, what if there's no shit behind me? And the lion tamer says, there will be. <laughs> a beautiful gag, beautifully told. I have no idea whose joke that, I have no idea whose joke that is, but I loved that. Oh, <laughs> so there you go. oh, I absolutely loved it. And I loved having you on the podcast. You said you were a thrill seeker. It's been an absolute thrill to have you on the Humorology podcast. Thank you so much, Callie. Thank you, Paul. It's been a joy. The Humorology podcast was hosted by Paul Barros and produced by Simon Banks. Music by Steve Hayworth, creative direction by Les Hughes and additional research by Helen Sykes. Please remember to subscribe, like and leave a review wherever you get your podcasts. This has been a Big Sky production. <laughs>